Today we're walking in to chapter two. We're, we're leaving behind chapter one, the garden where there was uh, just unlimited access to the full revelation, the presence of God. And now we are moving into a world that is separated from God by our sin. There are new regulations that involve pain and sweat and suffering as the world no longer cooperates with us, but struggles with and often against us. There are also new responsibilities as we try to figure out how to govern and manage a world apart from the direct access to God that man once knew in the Garden of Eden. And the results of this post-Eden world are immediately painful. If you're taking notes, uh, chapter one followed Genesis one through three, and chapter two that we'll look at today follows Genesis four through 11. And in Genesis four, right after the temptation of Adam and Eve, like the next page over from them eating of the fruit and disobeying God, we see just how serious the infiltration of sin has been into the world. In, in Genesis 4, we learn that Adam and Eve gave birth. They had a son named Cain. And as the firstborn, Cain was the hope of God's prophecy that one day, through the lineage of Adam and Eve, through the lineage of broken people, someday a man would come who would do battle with the serpent, do battle with evil, and who would win once and for all. And the plan was for the firstborn to be the lineage through which this great man would come. They had another child named Abel, and we see in Genesis 4 that when they grew up, they showed just how depraved the world had become. It says, in the course of time, Cain presented some of the land's produce as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also presented an offering, some of the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but he did not have regard for Cain and his. And Cain was furious and he looked despondent. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you furious and why do you look despondent? If you do what is right, won't you be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. And what I love about Cain's interaction with God is that it displays what we talked about a little while last week, that the greatest inherent gift that God put inside humanity is the gift of free will, that we have the ability to choose. And God makes it very clear to Cain that he has a choice to make, that he can choose to follow God and that things will go well, but if he does not, that sin is crouching at the door and it will overtake him. And Cain is presented the same decision that in a post-Eden world, all of us have to make every moment of every day. It's the same decision that Cain's parents, Adam and Eve, had to make in the garden. Are we going to submit and follow, submit and follow, or rebel and fall? Submit and follow after God's plan for your life, no matter what it is that he's asking you to do, to submit that God is the one who is writing the pages of history. He's offered us an opportunity to be a part of it. And so no matter what the cost, we submit to what he desires for us, trusting in him, walking by faith and not by sight, or will we rebel and set ourselves up for a great fall? And like his parents before him, Cain desired recognition that didn't rightly belong to him. And what we see is that he cared more about how his offering to God made him look than how his offering actually pleased the God that he was offering it to. We quickly see that this really isn't about God at all. This is about Cain. If it was about God, then Cain would not get bitter over his offering being rejected. He would get better. He would grow closer to God. He would become more of a reflection of who God is to the world around him. But this was about Cain. How dare God not accept his offering? 
How could he have been rejected? How dare God embarrass him in front of his family and especially in front of his little brother? And so you probably know the rest of the story. Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked Abel and he killed him. Now, a lot of us are familiar with this story, even outside of Christian circles. Cain and Abel is a, a pretty well-known narrative. But sometimes our familiarity with something can throw us off of its significance. And what I want to see today is that in Genesis 3, we have the fall. In Genesis 4, one generation removed from the garden. The first siblings, one generation away from full access to God and his presence. And the first sibling relationship ends in cold-blooded murder. And Genesis 4 sets the baseline for the evil that exists in a post-Eden world. And if we're honest, we probably didn't need to rehash Cain and Abel to understand it. You probably only need 10 minutes of your evening news. You probably only need about four scrolls on your newsfeed. And we instantly become aware that the world is evil and jacked up. That we are a world that is far from perfection and that is far from God. You know, many people know the story of Cain and Abel, but not really aware of what comes next. And between Genesis 4 and Genesis 6, we see that God spared Cain's life and Cain eventually ends up with a lineage of his own. And we also see that God gave in Cain's place, and of course Abel was now dead, God gave Adam and Eve a third son named Seth. And Seth is an important character in scripture because he now takes Cain's place as the person whose lineage would ultimately lead to a savior. We see in Genesis 4 and 5 and 6, their family trees play out and Cain has abandoned God, abandoned worship, abandoned sacrifice, abandoned prayer, and they become more and more and increasingly and increasingly evil. And we see Seth's lineage, which stays true to God and continues to walk with him and follow him and pray to him and sacrifice to him. And by Genesis 6, through the lineage of Cain, the world has become so evil that God decides it's time to wipe the slate clean. God's method he chooses is a worldwide flood that will kill every inhabitant on the earth with one exception. In a culture seven generations removed from Adam, a culture where people are constantly propping themselves up, trying to make their own names great, trying to live as their own gods, a world in open rebellion and setting themselves up for a great fall. There is one man who stands righteous before God. One man who hasn't wavered, who learned from his parents and grandparents and great grandparents all the way up to the patriarch of his lineage, Seth. And the man's name, as you know, is Noah. And this is what God says to Noah, the great, 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 great grandson of Seth. God said to Noah, I have decided to put an end to every creature, for the earth is filled with wickedness because of them. Therefore, I'm going to destroy them along with the earth. Understand, pay attention, Noah, because I'm bringing a flood. And this is interesting because then he describes what a flood is. Noah, pay attention. I'm bringing a flood. Flood waters on the earth to destroy every creature under heaven with the breath of life in it. Everything on earth will perish, but I will establish my covenant with you. You will enter the ark with your sons and your wife and your son's wives. And, uh, you know, we go through this so quickly sometimes and like, Maybe you grew up in church and you've heard these and these are kind of Sunday school. And maybe you went to my church where they had the felt board and they could like stick the things on there, you know. And some of you are like, what are you talking about right now? And that, that's a beautiful thing too. And, and what we miss sometimes is in the details. And it's interesting that God is explaining a flood. But when you step back and look at it 
with a full short story long perspective, you start to realize how insane what God asked Noah to do actually was. The reason that Noah didn't understand flood is because Noah lived in the middle of the desert, nowhere near a body of water. And many people believed that at this point in the world, it had never, ever, ever rained. So he's going, listen, pay attention, Noah. There's going to be a flood. And he's like, what? A what? A flood. Like there's going to be water everywhere and it's going to kill everyone. And so you're going to get in the ark. And Noah's like, the what? And he's like, no, I'm, I'll lay it out. You're going to build the Titanic in the middle of the desert by hand in a world where it doesn't rain. It's going to take you a lifetime and you will be the constant embarrassment of your society. It's insane what God was asking Noah to do. And Noah has this critical decision. Do I submit to this crazy request and follow through with what God is saying? Taking decades upon decades upon decades to by hand build a giant ship? Or do I go my own way? The rest of the world is living in rebellion apart from God's plan. It wouldn't be too crazy for Noah to do the same. But Noah submits. He starts building a boat in the desert. And scripture says that people are mocking him constantly. People are like, hey, Noah, nice boat. I think Noah's lost his mind. All right, moving on. I tried to think of like, what would be a similar, like what would be that crazy in real life, like, like today real life? And uh, so I thought, like, what if the next time you went a few miles here in San Antonio to Government Canyon and your friend was just like, oh, man, working like crazy. He put up some, like, log cabins. There was, like, a lift going up this. And you were like, hey, bro, uh, what are you doing? And they were like, oh, man, untapped market. I'm building a ski resort. <laughs> here? In South Texas? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No one's really doing it. Right. <laughs> the world thinks he's crazy. And a world in rebellion mocks Noah's submission until the rain begins to fall. And then they quickly realize that his submission is the only chance of salvation. And it's interesting because the Bible doesn't say that Noah shut the door to the ark. Noah wasn't like, peace, <laughs> made fun of me for a couple decades, I'm out. Noah was a nice guy. In fact, I think if he could have, he might have let some people on. It says God shut the door. Because chapter one isn't the end and chapter two isn't the end. God has a plan and his plan centered on a promise through the line of Seth to a man named Noah who through his righteousness and his submission, when it was insane to submit, the promise would still come to pass. Here's the hard thing is a lot of us want to live for God and we want to be a part of his movement. And we know that we need to submit. We need to do what God tells us to do and impresses on us to do. The hard part is that we don't get to choose what it is that God asks from us. We don't get to choose what he requests for us to do. All we're responsible for is our response. Will we submit or will we rebel? And oftentimes the very thing that God asks you to do that will bear the most weight in your life and have the most significance is the thing that will cost you the most, is the thing that will put you in direct opposition to what everyone around you is doing. Why are you living your life building an ark? Why are you wasting your time? You're in the desert. This doesn't make any sense. You might be asked to do something where you lose some of your status, where you lose some of your popularity. You may not make as much money as you could. You may have to steward your resources differently. You may have to give up some habits that have been a part of your life for so long that they've become a part of your identity. What God asks you to do 
will probably cost you. And you have to decide whether you're going to submit or rebel. There is no other option. Will you follow or will you fall? The flood ends and Noah and his family, they're saved. It's really cool because uh, after they exit the ark, God reaffirms the divine calling that he had given to Adam and Eve in the garden. Do you remember we were given a divine status? By your very nature as a human being, you are made in the image of God. That means that you were put on earth to reflect the glory and power of God to everyone and everything around you. You were made to bear God's image. Not only do we have a divine status, but we have a divine calling. God told Adam and Eve to fill the earth and to rule over it. And when Noah and his family exit the ark and they are now going to propagate all of the rest of the world, they are given the same mandate. Remember Noah. It's the same script. You are to fill the earth and to subdue it. And they took off Society increased rapidly. The population boomed over the next thousand years. But every person who was born into a post-Eden world was faced with the same decision moment after moment. Submit and follow or rebel and fall. Submit and follow or rebel and fall. And eventually, about a thousand years later, we see a world once again in open rebellion. And I want to kind of compare the story of Noah in Genesis 6 to the story that we're about to read in Genesis 11 of the Tower of Babel because they both were about a massive construction project, but they both had very different intentions and very different outcomes. In Genesis 11, we read that the whole earth had the same language and vocabulary. And if we're following the biblical narrative, then of course they did because they all came through Noah, who was a descendant of Seth. They all had the same language and vocabulary. As people migrated from the east, they found a valley in the land of Shinar, and they settled there. They were migrating. They were moving to fill the earth and subdue it. As they migrated, they found a valley, and they settled. And they said to each other, Come, let us make oven-fired bricks, and they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower with its top in the heavens. And then they lay out very clearly their two intentions for this tower. Let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered throughout the earth. Let us make a name for ourselves and Let's stay put. And the decision at the tower we call Babel was in direct opposition to our given divine status as image bearers of God and our given divine calling to fill and rule the earth. They said, no, instead of us reflecting the glory of God, instead of living as divine image bearers, giving our energy and who we are to make the name of God great, we will build a tower to make our own name great. At this time, in this worldview, the sky was the realm of divinity. They even believed that mountaintops were the place of divinity. They didn't climb to the top of mountains. They didn't fly over them in airplanes like we do today. They thought that they could literally elevate themselves to be a God. It's the same temptation in the garden. Don't you know if you eat the fruit, you will be like God? It's the temptation to Cain. Are you really going to let God tell you what to do? It's the temptation in Noah's day to stay in open rebellion when God is clearly asking for submission. And here we are once again going in direct opposition of our divine status as image bearers of God, and then disobeying our divine calling. We don't want to travel. 
We found a valley we like just fine. And if we build it big enough and if we build it tall enough, then we can all stay right here. Once again, the world was living to prop themselves up, to make their own name great, to fly in the face of God's calling and live in open rebellion. And God sees not only the tower, but the heart of mankind. And this is where in scripture it says that God came and confused the languages. And as people sectioned off by language, it created tribes and communities and eventually nations and even kingdoms. And as we have the division of the nations, we land on the doorstep of chapter 3. But before we wrap up today, I have a question. I didn't have this in my sermon when I wrote it two weeks ago. I didn't have it in my sermon last night, but I woke up this morning with a question, and I want to ask you, what are you building? Everyone is building something. To not build is not an option until our time on earth is done. So the question is, what are you building? Because the temptation that was alive and well in the garden and the temptation that came to Cain and to Noah's time and the temptation that caused the confusion of the languages at the Tower of Babel, the same temptation is in the world today. Be your own God. Do it your own way. Make your own name great. What are you building? Are you living your life building an ark? Are you submitting to God even when it makes no sense? Are you submitting to God even when it costs you something? Are you submitting to God even when the people around you may question you or clown on you or, or, dis, or you will disappoint them or they'll separate themselves from you? Are you building an ark? Are you doing whatever it takes to follow God even if it means something as ridiculous as building a ship in the desert? Or are you living your life building a tower? Think about who you are and what you have, your unique giftings and your talents, your skills, the tools that you have been given, the platforms and places that God has placed you in in this world, the sphere of influence of the people who are around you, the family that he's positioned you in. Are you using who you are and what you have to build a tower, to make your name great, to prop yourself up, to build your own status, your own net worth, your own abilities, or are you living to make the name of God great? Because here's, here's the bottom line. You can do it. You can have a name greater than any other human being on planet Earth. You can have more followers and more status and more money and better rides and bigger houses and more relationships and more sexual conquest. And you can be the envy of everyone in the office and everyone in the neighborhood, but no no matter how great your name gets during your time on earth, there is only one name given under heaven among men where you can be saved. And what you will find is that if you position yourself as your own God, at some point you cannot bear the weight of divinity and you will fall. So what are we building? Because we all have tools, and we all have different tools. You know, the, the thing, like, when I came out to Metachurch to, to have the opportunity to pastor out here, um, one of the things I've been most proud of is the diversity in our room, like across every demographic, including uh, economics. We have a, a wide range of economic demographics who are here and are a vital part of our movement. and. Uh, and not everyone has the same tools and not everyone has the same resources. Not everyone has the same giftings. Not everyone has the same talents. With what you have, with what God's put in your hands, what are you building? A tool that most of us in the room have is, is this right here that has more technology in it than sent men to the moon. And it's a tool, it's brick and mortar, 
It, it's, it's wood and saws. And are you building an ark? Are, are you using this as a tool to show people the glory of God, to rise his name above all others, to put others before yourself, to love on your family and on your spouse? Or are you building a tower? How are you using the tools you've been given? Are you propping yourself up? Are you lifting yourself above others? Are you figuring out your value based on the number of likes and hearts and shares and retweets and the number of women that you have in your phone that you don't want people to know about because it gives you a sense of superiority over others? Are you judging yourself based off of the information that you're taking in with all of the content in the world at your fingertips? Are you making your name great or God's? We're all building something and we're all imperfect and we're jacked up. And some of you are working really hard to build an ark and I'm working really hard to build an ark, but I can look back on my life and I will admit to you right now, I've spent most of my life building a tower. And even now, I will be diligently at work and I'll get sidetracked and I'll fall back in a worse way and I'll fall back in a behavioral pattern and I'll get knocked off by life events and, and I'll lose faith and, and I'll come back over here and I'll, and I'll put my hand back to the task of building a tower and, and hopefully there are people who love me enough and they shift me back over and I realize my true significance can only be found by building an ark, by building a way to help other people realize salvation. Because if anyone could have built a tower, it was Jesus. Anyone could have built a tower. This is what the Apostle Paul said. Jesus, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God. He is co-equal with God in human flesh with the power of heaven at his disposal. And he did not consider that something to be exploited. He did not use that to build the ultimate tower. Instead, he emptied himself. By assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And as insane as it was for God to ask Noah to build an ark in a desert, how, how much more insane is it for God to ask Jesus to build a movement on a cross? It's crazy to build a ship where there is no water, but it's even crazier to say we're going to start a movement by putting you to death. But Noah submitted because God had a plan. And Noah doesn't write the pages of history. God does. And Jesus submitted because God had a plan. And he went to the cross. And the same way that the ark was the only hope of salvation from the imminent doom of the flood, the cross is the only hope of salvation for the wrath of being eternally separated from God. The question is, what are you building? Are you gonna submit? If God asks for an ark, are you gonna give him an ark? Or will you rebel? We live in a society that builds towers. We live in a society where we're taught to prop ourselves up. But like Cain, you have a choice. What are you gonna build? It all points to the last chapter, after Jesus, after the church. The last chapter is where we stand before God and we give an account for our lives and we review what we built. And if we spent our whole life building towers, we will have the painful realization that we wasted the time God gave us on earth that we missed out on our divine status, our divine calling, that we lived to build up our own name instead of the name that saves. But if you live in submission, if you're an ark builder, if you live in a way that reflects the glory of God to everyone around you, if you show people the cross, the hope for their salvation, then when you stand and review your life, you will look around at a multitude of people who are also in glory because you lived in a way to help them get back to the garden.
Would you guys pray with me? God, we love you. This is a challenging word, especially in our culture, and you know that. God, we want to build something significant with our lives. We want our lives to matter. I believe that about every person in this room. I believe that you've given them an amazing purpose and that they can walk in the power of that purpose. God, I am looking out on a room full of divine image bearers and I pray that we would get closer and closer to you because the closer we get to you, the more accurately we can reflect your glory. I'm looking out at people who you have given a mandate to join with you as your ambassadors, your hands and feet on the earth. And you've given us a great calling to point people to your son, Jesus. Pray we would have the courage and the confidence to do that. I pray as we get clearer and clearer on the Bible, your word, that we would have more context to understand how we can do that. And we love you. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. And everybody said. Thanks for joining us today at MetaChurch Online. We would love to know how God is using this ministry to affect your life. If you have a story about how God has spoken to you through this online platform, we would love to hear about it. You can send an email to info at metachurch.tv. We would also love for you to partner with us financially to help us continue to expand what God is doing through Meta Church. You can do that very easily at metachurch.tv by clicking on the Give button. You can give a one-time donation or you can set up to give recurringly and to continually support what God is doing. Every time you give, you invest in eternity. We hope to see you here next week.